Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon for those of you watching on the East Coast. This is Tulio Siragusa, and this is the Design Thinking Show by Dojo Live. Welcome. Today, my guest is Mark Bruno, VP of Product at Sensible Weather. I'm looking forward to speaking with Mark. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. So we're talking about design thinking. How does that apply into developing go-to-market strategy, products, and organizational structures? And a great focus on design thinking is about empathy. What role does empathy play in delivering not just transactional values for users and people, but also emotional, meeting their emotional needs? And that's really the key, right? So today, our guest, we're going to go through seven key questions to see what we can learn from Mark and from his company, Sensible, about uh, how they're applying design thinking to their business. And hopefully as you watch, maybe there'll be some pointers you can apply as well. But before we do that, let's get to know Mark. Mark, if you could please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I'm Mark Bruno. Uh, I've worked in early stage and growth stage companies for most of my career with a focus on building teams. And I've been fortunate to a couple of times gone from a few people in a co-working space to hundreds of employees. Uh, I'm currently the VP of product at Sensible Weather. And so I work at the intersection of strategy and experience design. And so strategy is about understanding our market, our position in that market and our opportunities, as well as our differentiators and our competitive advantage. And then experience design for us is about taking that market understanding, pairing it with deep insights about our users and developing a product that drives real value for those users. Great. Well, tell us about what Sensible does. What is the company all about? What's the value you guys are delivering? Yeah, so Sensible Weather, uh, we're a climate risk technology company. And our first product, is, we call a weather guarantee. And so this is for consumers in travel and outdoor and events. And in the most basic sense, you can think of Sensible as the people that pay you back when weather makes your outdoor experience less enjoyable. And so we do this actually through our climate engine and our parametric platform. Uh, essentially, we're able to understand climate risk for any type of weather anywhere in the world. And then our platform designs a custom weather guarantee for our users that gives them coverage that's useful for the experience that they want to have and at a price that makes sense for them. Um, we're actually a, a B2B2C company. And so we work with travel brands, travel suppliers to offer their customers a weather guarantee when they're booking. Um, so, you know, whether it's a resort stay in Miami, um, you're going skiing with a family and you have rentals and lift tickets, or you're going to a Sox game in Austin, for example. Uh, we can provide a weather guarantee that would reimburse you if weather makes that experience less enjoyable. Um, and so weather guarantees actually aren't cancellation insurance. And instead, you should think of a weather guarantee as being about your experience. So you still go, but if that experience is diminished or isn't what you wanted the experience to be because of weather, we'll reimburse you automatically. And what that looks like is, you know, you wake up in the morning, um, let's say you're in Miami, for example, let's use that. And we'll actually check the forecast for you, figure out if the weather is going to impact your day. And we'll text you in the morning. It's like, hey, it's going to rain today between one and four. Click this link to get your reimbursement. Click that link. We have simple reimbursements like Venmo, PayPal, bank transfer. And then get on with your day. Get out there and have an experience regardless of the weather. All right. That's amazing. The topic you chose <laughs> today was uh, innovating in complex environments, you know, design thinking in complex environments, specifically yeah. for the B2B to C marketplace so let's see what we can learn uh because that's kind of a daring thing right yeah. guaranteeing something you can't control <laughs> and so it's exactly. pretty amazing <laughs> and so we're very curious to see how you guys are doing that so if you had to explain to uh the audience sort of what methodologies were used to develop the company's go-to-market strategy what would you uh say that is i mean there's so many different tools out there right uh you got lean canvas you got the austro wilder strategic map but there's so many different ways to create a go-to-market strategy but what, what were some of the, your methodologies that helped you figure out let's go and create a guarantee for people <laughs> so they can have an awesome day on something we can't control so i'm curious how that came about yeah so weather guarantees aren't exactly where we started um we were founded in 2019 and so our technology is about understanding and mitigating climate risk. That's our core technology. And you can obviously see how that applies to so many consumer problems and so many business problems. Um, but our original principle is this idea of building a consumer grade climate engine that could bring this data that historically has only been available to hedge funds and large insurance companies, bring that to everyday people, bring that to everyday problems. And so 
really our core, all of 2020 and 2020 was an interesting year for everyone. It was a very interesting year to be building a travel product for sure. Um, so all of 2020 was about research, understanding user behavior, evaluating financial structures and evaluating mar market forces. Um, so yeah, I can kind of story tell a little bit about what that looked like for us. Yeah, uh, please. Initially, sure. a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations, meeting with people and just discussing how does how do they think about weather? What does weather mean to them? Identifying the words that they use to talk about weather. Those words are always a very key, key concept to understanding behaviors. Uh, and then eventually forming out sort of a product and really rapid prototyping. Um, so we use Figma and do a lot of prototyping and getting a product in front of people and trying different structures. And honestly, I'm incredibly and was incredibly embarrassed putting some of these prototypes in front of people, but that's okay, because that's what you need to do, right? You need to go out there and get people to react to something. And I'm, I'm no longer embarrassed. I love our product now, but it comes from this sort of humility and this um, ability to kind of like put yourself out there and have these conversations with real people, understand how they react, understand how they think. Um, and I honestly, I love even the, the negative reactions were some of the best reactions we could have had. And, you know, and, 2020 talking about travel and saying we're going to pay you back when it rains a lot of people are like that's that's dumb i don't really care and right and like a lot of people are like oh my god i need this right away and so you start threading this needle uh with like connecting these different conversations and trying to draw understanding um but ultimately at the end of the summer of 2020 we couldn't launch our product there wasn't really travel to launch our product into so we had this interesting idea and we actually went and created uh what we called a survey experience and so we put people in a mindset we first asked them to think about a past trip they took sort of get out of the space of today let's think about the past and get them in this emotional this empathy space that you're talking about have them start thinking about themselves and what they enjoyed about a trip and what they uh remember about that trip and then we turned it and we said okay now think ahead think of a time past where we are in 2020 and think about a trip that you want to plan. Where do you want to go? And then also, what are you going to do? How much are you going to spend? And then we took that moment and we actually offered them the very original concept of a weather guarantee uh, and got their feedback and said, do you Amazing. want to buy this? Yeah. And so that is so cool. It's like it was, you know, it was very cool. Yeah. During a time where people are like feeling stuck, you're reminding them of the emotions of what it was like to go somewhere. And then exactly. And then giving them the hope that that could happen again soon. I, I Brilliant. Exactly. Brilliant. All right. Exactly. So how, how does the company foster innovation? How do you codify this across the organization? Because that kind of thinking isn't something just a small group of people do. That's pervasive inside of the organization. How do you guys do that? How do you go about fostering that kind of innovation? Absolutely. Inherent in your question is the idea of culture, obviously. And everyone uh, everyone who's seen this, and it's kind of the, the old trope of saying it's culture, right? But I... When I think about culture, there's really three things about our culture that foster innovation specifically. Um, and an overall concept is this idea of nuanced moments that make an outsized impact. So, you know, 95% of when you see Sensible will look like other companies, but there's just this difference in this, this concept that pushes us beyond the normal path of startups into a different path. And so those three things, first is open conversation. Um, we try and ensure that all of our conversations are in the open. We're very transparent. And so how that actually manifests day to day, you know, if somebody were, if there's two people slacking and they're having a conversation, the immediate thought is, hey, let's put this in an open channel. Let's make sure everyone can see this. Um, or if we're, you know, in a one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, on a Zoom call, we're a remote team, obviously. Um, if we're in a, in a Zoom call and it's like, hey, you know, we actually should involve these other people in the conversation. Let's pause this conversation now and let's bring those people in. So the first thing is open conversations. Um, the second thing is this idea that we talk a lot about is first team and second team. So it's sensible, everyone's first team is actually the group of people, the cross-functional group of people that they solve problems with every day. And so for a designer, that may be engineers and business stakeholders and um, uh, customer service, and for an engineer, et cetera, it might be the same. And second teams are your functional group, right? So as an engineer at Sensible, when I think about my team, I don't think my engineering team, that's just my functional support. That's my manager who gives me context and gives me support. But my first team are the people I solve problems with. And that's a really key element of innovation is bringing a cross-functional group of people together and enabling to feel like they're doing something. Um, this and then the last great. piece, yeah. Go ahead, the go last ahead. piece of culture I'll add, sorry, I'll to interrupt. Um, but this idea of data informed. And so we think of ourselves as data informed. Data-informed is different than data-driven for us. So data-driven, always looking at the data, always running tests. 
Data and form allow space for creativity, space for the subjective, space for the empathy, to use your word, and space for the vision. And so at Sensible, we go through these innovation and iteration, iteration cycles. So when you're first launching something, you're in an innovation cycle, you're taking a risk, you're trying to move somewhere, you launch that product, and then you go into an iteration cycle. So you move up this curve of performance, making small changes, improvements, tweaks, whatever it might be, but ultimately you'll reach a local maximum of performance. And so then you need to go through an innovation cycle to jump to a new curve and find that global maximum. And in the short term, you might actually have less performance, but you believe in that vision and you're going to move up that curve to have even greater performance. I love that data informed instead of data driven. Data driven feels very mechanical, right? Data informed. It is, yeah. It's the yeah. ability to put creativity. You answered uh, some of this a little bit, but I want to ask the next question anyway, because we might discover some nuances that we haven't yeah. discussed so far. So, how does the company design processes in support of delivering end user value? We talked. You talked a little bit about it, but how did you actually go about designing this process? Like what gave this idea that, hey, if you're having a conversation that seems interesting, open it up to everybody else. <laughs> how did you go about designing that process? Yeah, everything needs to be authentic. And so part of this whole entire story is the right people who truly believe that that's the right way to do something. And so it speaks towards hiring as well. And if you have the right people to start with, then process actually becomes very light. Uh, so for us, process is about focusing on the why. Our conversations are about why are we doing this? What is the higher level why? And how do we use that context and understanding to then drive our day-to-day -day work? Um, so I think a process, yeah, very light, keeping it uh, sort of in this why space. Um, but then the second piece of process is feedback loops. How do you build feedback loops into everything you do? And that's just part of your process. Um, for, for example, for me, uh, when we launched our product, I said, I'm going to talk to our first 1,000 customers. So I'm actually going to reach out to every one of our first 1,000 customers and try and talk to them. And that's a part of our process is this idea of inherent feedback loops and everything we do. And it's, well, that's a very difficult goal. I'll admit there's moments where I've dropped that goal, but so far we were able to talk to those people and we fostered even more understanding and sort of grew from that. Awesome. All right, so let's go a little bit further on how does the company put people's needs, you talked about people, uh, as the focal point of the product roadmap? This is something I'm really passionate about, actually. Um, so our roadmap actually starts with a narrative that we refresh every quarter. And so this narrative is fairly brief. It's maybe one to two pages long, but it's story tells about Sensible. The story tells about our users, it's story tells about what we know, and it's just about people. That's what this narrative represents. And so starting our roadmap from a story is really powerful because then your team and everyone on the team is understanding where this epic or this feature or this task that I'm working on fits into a story. And so again, going back to this culture of open conversations, this story isn't something that uh, is just dictated. This story is an open conversation. It reflects what all of us know and we can all see ourselves in this story. And there's something inherently powerful about truly believing in that story when you look then at the roadmap and the things you're doing day to day. All right, so often what happens is this sounds great, but there's competitors out there too, right? So mm -hmm. you have to balance this sort of uh, meeting market needs while differentiating yourself from competitors. So what are some of the lessons learned in the process of aligning market needs while differentiating from competitors? How do you balance that out? I, I think about this for myself lot as um, sort of a, a champion of strategy and thinking about the market. I, in a vacuum, Sensible can build an amazing product and we can drive amazing value for our users, but we don't live in that vacuum. And so we need to be paying attention to what are our potential competitors doing? What are um, substitute products looking like? And what are we kind of seeing in the market? And, you know, that impacts our roadmap and it does change the way we're looking. But I would also caution to say that for most early stage companies, unless you're talking about 10% market share or somebody having 10% market share, your competitors don't really matter. You do need to pay a lot more attention to your users. There might be strategic moments where you choose to go one direction over another direction, or you might integrate learnings from your competitors into your overall strategy. But until you're a massive corporation who you're really measuring your market share and whole percentage points, it doesn't matter. Stay focused on your users, stay focused on what they need, and then you'll win. 
You know, I found interesting over the years how many companies uh, redefine what a competitor is. Uh, for example, if you were trying to differentiate, say, different yourself, differentiate yourself in the customer service space, you wouldn't necessarily look at your competitor. Let's say you're a telecom company, right? You wouldn't compare how your other competitors are serving clients. You would compare yourself to the very well best known customer service company. You know, years mm -hmm. ago in the 90s, it might have been American Express, right? So then your competition isn't necessarily your direct competitor, it's who's providing better service, who's setting the bar high, right? It's this idea of e-commerce, Amazon set the bar pretty high in terms of getting things fast and being able to return them. So then you might not even be in that niche, but if you wanna be a company that it's easy to do business with, that's who's setting the bar. Uh, so how do you guys sort of think through that in terms of uh, adopting best in breed, best in class, uh, solutions for the marketplace that are not necessarily related to competitors, but you do you do you watch or observe certain uh, companies that you sort of admire for having done things very well, and then how do you codify that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, a we're living in this complex environment at Sensible where we're focused very intensely on our users who want to have an experience outside. But we work with our partners who have their own brands and have their own desires and have their own needs. And we're dependent on our partners to offer our product. And so one space that's really important to us is sort of our partner enable it. How do we make it really easy for our partners? How do we make it seamless? And how do we really drive a lot of value for them as well? And so when we look to the market, there's some very obvious examples, but we do talk about them a lot internally. We think of ourselves for our partners as a development platform, much in the way that Stripe is a development platform in the payments world. And so we look to that and we say, well, what do they do really well? They have amazing documentation. They have a lot of options that fit your business needs and they have the, the integrations as well. So like, it's exactly what you're saying where it's looking at this uh, other player in the market who sets the standard of expectation for our users, our partners. Um, another great example of that is uh, actually a firm as well. And so firm, isn't a competitor of ours. They do something entirely different, but they're an analogous in terms of the way that our product works and the way that our product feels across the partnership, adding value for that partner and then a user making their life better in some way. And so we ask this question all the time. How does a firm onboard a thousand partners in a very short period of time? How does Sensible onboard a thousand partners in a very short period of time? And so we look at these gold standards, these companies that have set the tone and we figure out how to apply them into our market and for our users. And there's differences. There's We can't do exactly what Stripe did. We can't do exactly what a firm did, but we can use those as models on our path of learning, which is really important. Brilliant. Okay, the final question for today, we're coming <laughs> up on time. If you had to do it all over again, what would you do more of? Huh. So for me, Sensible actually is that opportunity to do it over again. Uh, you can never, get it completely right. But everything we've talked about in this conversation is a reflection of what I've learned and what other people on the team have learned from building high high growth startups in the past. Um, we're in a really good place at Sensible. And so it's all about being proactive in preparing for those different scale points, 40 people, 70 people, 120 people. These all mean different things. And so it's about getting ahead and making sure that we're ready for those changes and what a team looks like at every point. Fantastic. It's been very uh, exciting speaking with you and learning about all this. I, I particularly like the idea that uh, you have created an open way to collaborate and to share ideas and to uh, basically foster innovation and engaging with the end users and getting feedback. And in some cases, you were saying, I was embarrassed to present this stuff. You were almost, uh, you were almost doing a reverse empathy, like having them have some empathy towards you <laughs> where you are, which is a great humbling way of being, uh, of being open to receiving uh, ideas and thoughts. So uh, as we part ways, any final words of wisdom you have for any organization that maybe hasn't adopted design thinking and how they they work and how they do things, what would you say to them? It's all about developing insights about your users. Go learn something about your users that other people don't know, and you're gonna develop an amazing product if you know something. Awesome. And then of course, aligning in the culture internally is the key thing as well. You can't have one without exactly. the other, as we've learned today. Uh, Mark, it's been great to have you with us. Uh, 
Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, come back at noon. We have another Dojo Live show at 12 o'clock Pacific today. And then see you at the next Design Thinking show soon. Have a good one.